we can debate the, the moral relativism and the subjectivity of morality, but I think deep down we all have a, a sense of what's right and what's wrong. And I think part of that comes from our ability to emp empathize. And so we acknowledge that when someone's suffering, that's not an action we should partake in. And so I think that we see animal suffering and when it's in front of us, we acknowledge that that's something that's wrong. But because we're so disconnected from the process, there's all these degrees of separation, we never truly have to feel the burden of responsibility. And so we never really truly have to empathize because they're always out of our minds. And so in those moments, we can kind of ignore that intuitive, kind of that moral intuity that I think we do have inside of us. We can kind of sidetrack that because we surround ourselves with other people who have also distanced themselves. And so that violence towards non-human animals almost becomes normalized in our minds. And so I think, well, why was the reason that I eat animal products? And it was taste. I mean, I said at the beginning, I loved how these products tasted. And that was really the reason I did it. I mean, I used to come up with different excuses, but it was taste for me. I always said I, I loved the products, and so why would I ever give it up? And so the question then becomes, well, that question I asked at the beginning, what has higher value, taste or life? And simplify that even further. The moral justification becomes sensory pleasure. And so it, the question then becomes, is sensory pleasure alone a good enough moral justifier for our actions, not just towards animals, but in terms of every situation. Let's apply that again, consistency. And so without having to, to name situations, I think we can all think of our th things in our mind that provide sensory pleasure to the oppressor, but of course provide a huge amount of suffering to a victim. And so the question becomes, well, is that action justifiable because it provides pleasure to the oppressor? Well, of course not. So taste alone is, is in and of itself doesn't provide a justification for what we do to animals. And so I think what, what can happen is we paint a very bleak reality of farming. And one issue that we can sometimes have is, is we point at factory farming. And we say, well, factory farming is the culprit. And what I'm describing now may be true when applied to a situation of intensive farming, but in a situation of, say, local or organic or high welfare farming, does that then become an OK act? The, the notion of local farming is somewhat paradoxical in itself because it insinuates that geographical location you know, creates welfare or creates happiness. But of course, every farm and every environment is local to someone. And it's not as if we travel, the ones we get closer to become better simply because we're closer to them. And so when people say, well, I buy from local farms, it's like, that's completely irrelevant to this conversation because local means nothing in terms of what happens in the facility. But what about like free range? Or what about say high welfare? And so before I was vegetarian even, I'd only ever buy free range eggs. And I was a bit snooty about it. And so I'd walk around the supermarket and I'd have like my half a dozen or a dozen free range eggs. I'd have like bacon and chicken, everything in there. And I'd see someone buying caged eggs. And I'd think, oh, what a horrible person. Like, how, how evil must this person be? Like, no, just no regard for animals at all. That's disgusting. And I still have that a little bit when people buy caged eggs. I'm like, that's really bad, you know? But it's funny how we have these, these inbuilt notions. And so for me, when I bought a, a box of free range eggs, what I do is I attribute my ideals of freedom onto those eggs. You see that word free and it has connotations. And so you apply those connotations onto the hens. And so freedom to me, and I'm sure to most of us, just means living a good life, whatever that means. Living a life where we get to do what we want, do things that come naturally to us. I guess fundamentally a life of, uh, that's free from exploitation, that's free from suffering, that's free from pain. And so for me, when I bought those box of eggs, I'd say, well, those hens have lived a good life. They've done the things that came naturally to them. They've lived a life without pain, without suffering, without fear, without exploitation. And that's why I bought them, because I was fed that lie, sold that idea, and that made me comfortable. And so what we have to work out is whether or not free range actually has those attributes of freedom placed upon those hens, or whether or not it's a marketing scheme to maybe ease our conscience. And so all free range hens come from hatcheries. This is where the, the chicks are born. Now, male chicks are useless to the industry. They won't produce eggs. And also, they, they're not the same breed as the chickens that we slaughter for meat, so they'll never grow to be profitable to the farmers. And so what happens is, is, is as soon as they're born, they're thrown onto conveyor belts. They're sexed, and the males and females are thrown onto separate conveyor belts. The males are taken to macerators, so giant macerators that ground them up alive. As soon as they're born, onto the conveyor belt, into a macerator, and gone. In the UK, that happens to 30 to 40 million male chicks every single year. And you think about the size of the UK, tiny. Think about the size of America, and also the amount of consumption in America. You can think we can multiply that number by quite, quite a huge amount. 
Now, the, the hens, the, the female chicks, they'll be de-beaked and they'll be taken to these barns. Uh, we label these as free-range barns, but again, in the UK, a farmer can legally house 16,000 birds per barn, which means he can legally house nine birds per square meter of space. You think about the size of a square meter and you have nine hens on there. And we call that free range. And all free range means in the UK is they have to have access to an outside area. And because of natural pecking orders and the sizes of the barns, many of the hens will still never get to go outside. And they're still cramped in these barns. And so what we do is we take them out of small cages and we put them in one big cage. We slap a label like free range on it. And all of a sudden we feel good about our purchases. And so what we have to understand is these industries operate on supply and demand, which means they only function if we buy those products from them. And if we had two options in front of us and well, this one contains this and this one doesn't, I mean, we're gonna be more naturally compelled to buy the one that doesn't. And so they have to sell us something that we want to buy. And so they sell this idea of local, of organic, of high welfare, of free range to ease our conscience. But in terms of free range, there is no freedom. And so what about in dairy? Because often what I hear in England, and I presume it's the same here, is, is farmers will say happy cows produce happy milk. It's this idea that consumers have to you know, consume a very high quality milk. And the only way farmers can get high quality milk is by making sure the cows are looked after. And so therefore they'd never neglect or mistreat cows because, well, they need good quality milk to sell to the consumer. And when I arrived in the US a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to Whole Foods to get some vegan I call them essentials, like the Beyond Meat Burger, etc. cetera. Anyway, in the fridge, there's a, a brand called Organic Valley Dairy Milk, and we might have seen it. And so the label on there is so idyllic, it's so beautiful, and it basically plays into everything we want from dairy farming. And so you have a mother, a human mother, with her baby, and she's leaning in and they're petting, say, the, the, uh, the cow's face. And it just, it represents everything we want to be, family owned, outside, you know, grass fed, outdoor pastures, happy families, happy animals. But actually that's, really insidious when we look at what happens in the dairy industry because cows are mammals who will only produce milk like humans to feed their children which means that farmers will forcibly impregnate the animals year after year to ensure they're continuously producing milk now when the babies are born the cows will be taken away from their mothers normally within the first 24 hours of life because if the calf is drinking the mother's milk that's less milk for the farmer to sell and after all a cow produces milk for humans right so why would a baby want to take their mother's milk? That seems strange, doesn't it? And so when you have this organic value milk, it looks idyllic, but what it is is it's quite insidious, quite nefarious almost, because you have a, a mother with her baby leading in, looking at a dairy cow who's had her baby taken away from her. It seems so messed up to me. And sometimes people try to argue about, well, does the psychological impact of that take a toll on dairy cows? But dairy farmers themselves will admit that the mothers will cry out for their babies for days, even weeks sometimes. And they do suffer psychological grief from what happens because they're matriarchal beings, they form matriarchal herds and they have an instinctive desire to nurture for their young just as we humans do as well. And in fact, I, I visited a dairy farm back in 2017 and, and I saw this process happening. The farmer showed it to us and I actually ended up walking alongside the mother cow and we were following where her baby was being taken but the farmer closed the gate on us both and stopped us from being able to get any further. And so I was looking at this mother cow and she looked at me and she looked really confused, just complete confusion. And that really broke my heart because I realized that these animals have no comprehension of why we do what we do to them. No one can explain to them what's happening, of course not. And I thought about the times in my life I'd been most scared and often fear was coupled with confusion because I just didn't understand. And how it amplifies the sensation of terror and fear if we don't know when it's going to end or even why it's happening in the first place. And I thought, well, what if we could speak to these animals? I mean, like, let's say that I could talk to that dairy cow in that moment or any of us could talk to the animals in that moment. What would we say to them? How would we describe it? How would we justify it? And I thought, well, we'd have to be honest, wouldn't we? And we'd have to say, look, I know your baby's been taken away from you. And I know that you're following because you want to see where your baby's going and, and raise your child, just as, of course, a mother you would. But I really like the taste of your lactations in my coffee. I like to go to Starbucks and have it, you know, heated up, steamed with some coffee because it tastes good. Or I like to congeal your lactations into a block called cheese and grate it on my pasta. So can you please be considerate of that? Or would we say, look, buying oat milk is a bit inconvenient for me. So can you understand that I know you don't want to be forcibly impregnated, but my convenience on the line here. I mean, or what would we say to ca uh, pigs in gas chambers? One thing I've not talked about is how pigs are often killed. 
Pigs are herded into metal cages in the UK. This is the most humane method of slaughter. And they're, and they're dropped into an abyss that's filled with an aversive mixture of CO2, carbon dioxide. And it causes the, the pigs to suffer from respiratory distress. They hyperventilate, they you know, thrash around, they even scream. And, and then they die, of course. And I thought, well, what would we say to the pigs in those gas chambers? Would we say, I know I see you thrashing and I hear you screaming, but I really like the taste of your flesh in between two pieces of bread that I call a bacon sandwich. Or, or would we say to the animals, like, I know that you don't want to be exploited and I know you don't want to be killed, but veganism is, is kind of extreme. And besides, this is my personal choice, so can you please respect that? Personal choice is something we hear about a lot, and often people say that I'm forcing my views. Um, and I think, well, that seems rather unusual to me, because should a choice simply be respected because it's a personal choice? I mean, every action that we make is a, a choice we've personally chosen to make, right? I mean, every decision we've personally chosen doesn't mean it's moral or immoral. You know, should, should someone's personal choice automatically justify the action that they're undertaking? If I went to a shelter, rescued a dog, brought them home, and then abused them myself, I've personally chosen to do that, but it doesn't make it acceptable, right? And so when we cite, say, something like personal choice, whose personal choice do we consider other than our own? Because every single year, trillions of animals, and it, it is trillions, are killed. They have a desire for life. Do we factor in their choice for life into that equation, or do we just do something because we've always done it and we don't question it? And so all we could really say to the animals is that. We couldn't say, I'm really sorry, because that'd be disingenuous. We couldn't say it's a necessity and we have to because that would be a lie. And I thought, well, if we had to justify it, how could we justify it? If they were saying, please don't, or please stop, or please don't do this to me, would we then be able to look them in the eyes and say, no, I'm sorry, it's too much. I like your flesh too much. So these are a lot of the questions that really made me want to be more vocal in, in what I do.